But I'm for us. The last time I will ask you to stand. First Corinthians chapter 16, verses 5 through 9. Amen. I'm going to be reading on in NIV translation of the Bible. First Corinthians chapter 16, verses 5 through 9. Where it reads, after I go through Macedonia, I will come to you. For I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you for a while. Or even spend the winter. So that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now. And make only a passing visit. This ain't going to be a drive-by. I don't want it to be like that. I want to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits, or if it be the Lord's will. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost. Here's why. Because a great door of effective work has opened to me. And yet there are many who oppose me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to focus our attention on that ninth verse. I want to hit you square in the head. A great door of opportunity has opened for me. But there are many who oppose it. And I want to use for this last installment of this conversation on mission-minded ministry, the Holy Spirit asked me, I asked the Lord, Lord, how do you want me to put the period on the end of this conversation? And he whispered to me, facing, preach about the door of of opportunity. And so by the will of God, I'm going to share with you and talk to you a little bit about the door of opportunity. Let's pray. Father, have your way in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. I want to underscore the fact that we're going to be traveling to Pastor Cousins Church this afternoon. And so our praise team, part, portion of our music and arts department is going with us. And I want to invite you to come with us, amen, directly after service. I understand they're going to be feeding us lunch over there, and then we're going to be going right into the service, and I'm so glad to have an opportunity to celebrate that great man of God as he celebrates his anniversary. Amen? Amen. 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 The door of opportunity. Whenever somebody talks about an open door, it's a figure of speech, which represents, here it is, access, entry, and underscore this, permission. When God talks to you about a door of opportunity, he is saying to you, you have divine permission. Consequently, a closed door symbolizes no access or, or limited access. An open door is always symbolic of opportunity. Now, I'm going to say this. I recently bought a new home security device from a house, and the unique thing about this home security device is that it doesn't just uh, emit a sound when you open a door or a window. But it actually talks to you. Yeah, some of you have the same device at your house, that when you open a door or open a window, it doesn't just send off a beeping sound, but it actually talks to you, and it tells you specifically which door and which window is open. That doesn't leave you figuring it out, checking doors, and running into rooms, trying to find out where the breach is. But along with the sound that gets your attention, there is a voice saying, the back door is open. The window is open. The garage door is open. And I appreciate it because rather than me wasting time running around trying to figure out where the door is, my device is set up in such a way that it's telling me exactly. I'm looking for a specific door. That is open to me. I want to say to you that the doors that God opens in your life are tailor-made just for you. That is not just a door, but it is your door. That the things that God has for you, that God is so specific and tailor-made, and you are so much in his forethought, that when he opens a door, he gives you a signal. He gives you a word. He gives you a, a, a sign that this is your door. I'm glad for that because you have to understand that every door is not your door. Every door is not your door. Every man is not your man. Every opportunity is not your opportunity. Y'all not going to talk to me this morning. That there is something in someone in some place that is specifically designed for you and that it is not going to fit anybody else. This is your door. Look at somebody say, this is my door. My door. See, I want to emphasize that because this is a generation 
that values options. And you would think that the more options that you have, uh, the greater satisfaction you have. But, but, but there's a great body of research that suggests that that is actually the opposite is true. That, that suggests that, it can, that having too many options can have a negative consequence because people get frustrated and confused when you give them too many choices. And that people suffer from what they call choice overload. Everyone went through that in the store. I came in for one thing. <laughs> I came in for one item, and he gave it to me in several different sizes, several different colors, and I'm so frustrated that I finally just walk out. Ever done it before? Yeah. I've done it before. That sometimes when you give people too many options, too many options is not a good thing, that it gives you choice overload, which leads to choice paralysis, where I don't do anything. I only came for one thing. And if you gave me the choice between, between the, choose, the, the option to choose between three things, I might have been okay. One, two, three. But by the time you gave me 12 options, it's too many options, too many choices, and I, out of frustration, end up making no choice. But God has made it easy for you. He makes it easy because what he does is he gives you a door that is for you. And I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but God began to deal with me specifically about some things that you have had to refuse. And then sometimes you regret it thinking, should I have done it? Should I not have done it? Should I have gone? Should I have stayed? And the frustration and regret that sometimes we go through are wondering if that was my door, if that was the person I should have been connected to. Should I have been at that church? Should I have took that opportunity? Should I have gone into that situation? And God wants to minister to you about the opportunity that he has given to you. This is your door. Look at somebody and say, this is my door. In our text here, Paul is having a discussion with his colleagues about his travel plans. And he is explaining to them that he is going to be going through Macedonia. And some of you will remember Macedonia was the place that God had given to Paul in a vision. We had a vision of a man saying, come help us. And the Macedonians were of such great uh, people that they were very generous people. And that he was going to be passing through Macedonia because he was on a building camp, not a building campaign, but a charity campaign. We was gathering up resources and the Corinthian church wanted to participate in being able to be a blessing to another church. That's not something you see much nowadays, a church helping another church. Everybody is concerned about you helping my church. But, but they were gathering up, and they had such charity in their hearts that they wanted to get together and help. And so the Corinthian church wanted to help. And so he explains to them it is his desire to come and hang out with them for a while. I want to come hang out with y'all. I don't want to do a drive-by. I want to hang with y'all for a while. I'm a... I'm going to hang out and eat some chicken. Yeah, we're going to have some Christian fellowship. I want to do that. I don't want this to be a drive-by, but, but this is a task I'm on. I'm on a mission. I'm not being funny. It's just something pushing me. And some of you can relate to that, where sometimes you have to discontinue conversations and discontinue people that you hang out with, and they think you're being funny. It's just that you're being mission-minded. I would hang out and do uh, simple things sometimes. I would just, just fellowship, hang out, and talk about and catch up on stuff and all that, have a good family reunion. But sometimes there's such a push in my back, such a pull towards destiny that forbids me from hanging out and doing ordinary things because I feel a pull. Is there anybody in here that feels a pull towards destiny? I mean the kind of pull that people think you're acting funny towards them. And it's not that I'm acting funny towards them. I just don't have time for the gossip. I don't have time for the foolishness. I don't have time to talk about the he say and she say. That there's something pulling me towards a destiny. And it is so strong that I can't hang out with you very long. I can't, I can't spend a whole lot of time on the phone gossiping about people's business. I don't mind nobody's business that don't pay me. You hear what I say? I don't mind nobody's business. The only business I mind is the business that pays me. I don't have time for this because there's a pull. And I'm not being funny. I'm not being weird. I'm not trying to act like I'm better than you. But there's a pull towards destiny that is pushing me so hard that sometimes it pulls me away from things that I, I might well want to do. 
Paul is an example of what it's like to be a mission-minded person. That's what we've been discussing all month. A purpose-driven person. When I talk about being a mission-minded person, I'm talking about being laser-focused on your goals and your mission in life. To seize opportunities and to avoid distractions. Paul's efforts contributed greatly to the growth of the church. And whenever you do something that contributes to the growth of the church, whenever you step into a position of influence, it comes with unusual temptation. I was talking to the leaders that we're working with. They're getting ready for their license. I said, listen, if you step up into this, it's going to come with some unusual attacks. Some unusual. I mean, there's normal stuff that you go through anyway. But if you step into a place of influence where you start contributing to the growth of the kingdom and the growth of the church, it's going to open you up to some unusual temptation. And when I talk about temptation, I'm not talking about sexual. See, we always go there and we say temptation. I'm talking about trials, unusual tests, that there be things that will come upon you that will be strange and weird and stuff will come out of nowhere. That, 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 that there be things that, that, that you can't even explain. And it's because the enemy knows that if I let you continue in your level of influence, it's going to continue to have an impact on his kingdom. And so he sends these distractions to keep you from being effective. You follow what I'm saying? That these things are not unusual. That you need to expect it. Jesus did it. Immediately after he was anointed, the Bible said that the spirit took him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Temptation is not the sin. It's giving into the temptation. That's the sin. If temptation was a sin, then Jesus would have been a sinner. But because he was somebody who was ordained of God and called of God and was about to have impact, the enemy wants to distract you. And all distractions have not, don't have to do with sin. Sometimes we're distracted with good things. That there are good things, that though they are not sin, they are things that pull you away from your ultimate purpose and your goal. That it's not about being distracted with being in sin or being in crazy places, but it's just that when you look at what God is trying to call you to do, that these things may not be helping your goal and your purpose. I was sharing with the ladies last week on the She platform that it's important, ladies, that you protect your brand and protect your name. I was sharing with them how important it is that when you're a person of purpose and you care about your mission, that it may not be sin, but there are some places that your name should not be in. Some places that a lady just shouldn't go that has nothing to do with sin. Let me give you some Bible that all things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. That there are certain places and certain situations that you shouldn't show up, not because you can't, not because it's not sin, but it might not be helping your brand. It might not be helping your reputation. It may not be leading you to the conclusion of your goal, your purpose, but in fact could be taken away. And if your name keeps showing up in places that it shouldn't, then all of a sudden people start giving you the name and start saying that you're for the streets. Yeah, because there's certain places, even the men, there's certain places that I could go, but I won't go because this is not going to be good for my brand. It's not going to be good for my name. It's not going to be good for the goal that you have set for your life. It's not going to be good for your mission that some things that you do not do because it's going to hurt what I'm trying to accomplish ultimately. What am I saying? I'm saying that this is the season of intentionality. That everything you do, everybody you connect with, everybody you associate with, it has to be intentional. That this is not the season for you to hang out with people and be in places that are distracting from your mission rather than furthering your mission. That if I call you, if I hang out with you, if I fellowship with you, if you're in my phone for any reason, it is intentional. The day for you having people that just want to hang out with you because they're curious, they want to pick you up and play with you for a while and then put you back, that day is over. Everybody I connect with, align with, associate with, there is a mission in mind. Trust and believe. If I call you, there is a reason. If I pull you alongside, there is a reason. If I have you in my circle, there is a reason. I am intentional. Everybody I align with, everybody I associate 
associate with, everybody I call and everybody I talk to. I'm not just calling to hickle and kickle and play games. I'm calling you for a reason. Look at somebody and say, be intentional. Woo, calm down, facing. You got to watch your brain. You got to be intentional. Paul was intentional. I would hang out with you and fellowship and hang around, but I got something on my mind. I got something on my mind. And you have to understand this season that when God begins to elevate you, that that elevation comes with temptation. And don't be so busy celebrating the elevation that you ignore the temptation. Please understand, I was talking to another minister, and I said, your star is rising. Yeah, God is blessing you. God is giving you opportunity. God is giving you exposure. I said, but be careful. I said, because truth be told, when you come out from among them, you also become an easier target. And you're so fascinated by the attention that you're not paying attention that you are an easier target. Because people shoot at the deer they can see. While you were down in the ranks and nobody knew your name and nobody paid attention to you, they weren't even trying to kill you down in there because nobody knew you were. But the moment God began to elevate your name and your star, you become an easier target and not just for temptation and attack, but sometimes you start, getting a, you start becoming a target for pride and ego. And see whenever, see, 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 whenever God opens a door, it's typically a wide door. It's not a crack. It's not a crevice. It's a wide door. And God can elevate you so high. And when you're not used to having attention like that, we're not used to having a wide door like that, then you become drunk with the attention that you receive. Because I went from somebody who was a nobody to a somebody, and you can be drunk with the attention. You're like somebody who's the ugly duckling and suddenly turns into a swan. And you are overwhelmed with the attention that suddenly comes from being pulled out of obscurity into notoriety. And people who are in notoriety deal with another level of temptation that people that are in obscurity do not deal with. Y'all not talking to me this morning. And so you have to be careful. That's what Paul said. He said, God has opened to me a wide door of opportunity. And because of this wide door of opportunity that's been given to me, I'm on the devil's radar. I come to tell somebody, but what you're going through right now is because you're on the devil's radar. As long as you were sitting there in the bushes in the shadow and paying and doing nothing and getting involved, the devil was paying you no attention. But the moment you decide to become a person of purpose, when you started laying down certain things and only picking up certain things, it put you on the devil's hit list. It put you on the radar. You took the position, but you didn't know that the position was going to get that kind of jealousy, did you? You didn't know you didn't get that kind of pushback, did you? You was all celebrating because I got the position, I got the job, I got the promotion, hallelujah. But you didn't know that once you stood up, see, I got deer in my backyard, a whole bunch of deer in my backyard. And all while they sitting, amen, in the bushes, you don't see them. But when they come out of the bushes, they become an easier target. I can see them very easily. And that's what's happened with some of you. God has given you elevation. God has raised your star. God has given you a name. He's given you a wide door of opportunity, but that opportunity comes with opposition. That great opportunity comes with trouble. That those two things come together. You're not going to be somebody who walks into the blessing and don't have no problems. You're not going to be somebody that the devil is going to let you just walk onto the kingdom and slap him in the face and he's just going to sit there and eat potato chips. You're not going to enjoy all the favor, all the blessings, all the doors open to you and not have opposition and not have hatred and not have an attack of the enemy. Because now you are an easier target. You are a kingdom shaker. You are somebody that he has to watch. You're now on his watch list. And so along with the open door comes opposition. I mean, they come together. That the problem that you have, the obstacle you have, it's not, a, it's not a sign that you're doing something wrong, but it could be a sign that you're doing something right. It's not a sign that, oh my God, I got trouble, I must be doing something wrong. It could be that you're doing something right. Because if you weren't doing something right, then there wouldn't be a fight. As long as you went with the flow, there was no opposition, you went with the current. But the moment you decide to do something different, some of you would notice that even amongst your friends, 
that even when you're as long as you're with people who are down and you stay down, you have no option, no, no options. You have no issues with them. They have no issues with you. But the moment you want something different, the moment you want something better, now they start saying, well, you acting funny. Maybe it's just me. You acting funny now. You're acting like you're better than us. You're acting like you're special. I'm not being funny. It's just that I'm focused. Are there any focused people in the room right now? Who, when you decided that you were going to live better, that you were going to act better, that you were going to dress better, when you decided I'm not going to eat chicken food, but I'm going to start soaring like an eagle, that everybody don't like eagles, that's why eagles fly by themselves? As long as you're with chickens, there's a whole lot of them clucking around. But the moment you decide you're going to be an eagle, you're going to see your friends list start thinning out. Look at somebody and say, you sit next to an eagle. Yeah, eagles fly by themselves. I don't need no flock. I don't need a whole bunch of people. I just need the right people. <sighs> Hold fast to what you have. Don't let nobody take your crown. Stay faithful. Stay on task. Stay on script. Stay on mission. How you respond to a door is important. So write this down, number one. I'm going to talk to you about perspective. In scripture, a door is often used to express the opportunity to do God's will and advance his causes. I'm going to go deep here, and it's going to mess up some people. See, we don't always look at doors right. We tend to only look at doors as a way of escaping something that we don't want to be into. So when we pray, we say, God, open a door. Because I want to get out of here. <laughs> God, open the door. I want to get off this job. I want to get out of this marriage. I want to get out of this church. I want to get out of the situation. And I'm praying, God, open a door so I can get out. But a door also talks about coming in. That our perspective about a door can't always be about getting out of something. But perhaps God is trying to get you in something. When the apostles talked about the concept of an open door, it illustrated the opportunity to witness and to share the gospel. The, the apostles didn't pray for open doors like we do. We pray for God to open a door for us to get more stuff. You ever notice that? God, open the door so I can get a better job. Open the door so I can meet a boo. <laughs> I hope, God, this is my opportunity to meet my Boaz. <laughs> God, 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 give me an opportunity. Give me a job. Give me a business. Give me whatever it is that you're praying for. We're praying, God, give us stuff. Beloved, I believe that sometimes God withholds some things because you don't really have a kingdom mindset. You want things to consume it upon your own lust. And that all the things that you're praying for is so that you can be better, you can be further, you can have more. For what? For what? Check this out. When was the last time you prayed for God to give you a job and you went on the job saying, Lord, who am I supposed to witness to? They ain't with me today, Don. When, when was the last time you were praying for a new house in a neighborhood and you walked around, you rode around the neighborhood thinking, Lord, who am I supposed to witness to in this neighborhood? Who am I supposed to impact in the neighborhood? When was the last time you prayed that God would bless your business? Not so you can brag about your ability to buy a new car or a new bag, but you got, ask God to bless your business so that you could be a blessing to somebody else. So that perhaps through your business, you could give somebody a job. See, y'all don't want to talk to me today. Perhaps God is not blessing you to be on that job just for a check. I know you need a check, but perhaps he's not giving you influence on that job simply because you want a position, but he's put you in a place that you can have influence with people, that you could talk to people, that you could impact people, that you are like Joseph in your job, that God has raised you up so he can use you to be an impact. Y'all not going to talk to me this morning because you think it's all about getting a new car so you can brag about the price of your car. But perhaps God wants to use your, yes, your new car to bring somebody to your church. See, you don't want to talk to me. I didn't have my Wheaties this morning, so I'm just coming down your street. Perhaps God is not just trying to give you something greater so you can brag about how great you are, but God has given you influence so that you can impact somebody else. Look at somebody and say, I'm a person of influence. 
I had a meeting this week and somebody asked me, uh, Pastor, why did you name your church Impact? And I looked puzzled. And I said, the name says it all. The name tells you our mission. That we are here to be disruptive. To make a change. You don't expect a name like Impact to have a, a church full of quiet people. If you walk into a church named Impact, you expect it to be dynamic. You expect it to make a difference. You expect it to be radical. You expect it to make a change. This ain't for the quiet folk. This ain't for the laid back, sedate folk. And I know sometimes we pick churches because it has a status or a name, but this church's mission is to have an impact on this city. Somebody shout impact. God told Abraham, I'm going to give you a name. I'm going to bless you and cause you to be a blessing. We are going to be blessed in this church because God wants us to be a blessing. And maybe the door God is opening is not about us getting out. But maybe it's about us getting in. And that the real fight to keep you out of that position is not because of the paycheck or the pay grade, but because God knows because you're a praying woman and you're a praying man. If you get in that position, you're going to cause somebody to be, be to be introduced to Jesus. The apostles prayed for an opportunity for a door to open so that they could spread the gospel. And maybe God is holding back some things from you because he know you ain't going to do right. He know you ain't going to influence nobody. He know that you're going to get on your job and be a secret squirrel for Jesus and be afraid to tell somebody that God is in my life and that I'm a Christian and that I'm a believer. And God said, I can't use you in that opportunity because you're too scary for me. But I need some bold, radical people who will walk up in a job or walk up in a community and say full throated, I am a believer. I am a Christian. And God sent me here to make a difference. Clap your hands if you know God is raising you up. If you know that you're blessed to be a blessing, would you give God praise right here? Oh, I got to go. I got to get out of here. Would you give God praise for God raising you up so you can be a person of influence? Stop always praying for God to get you out, but start praying, God, where do you want to send me? Where can I go? Where do you want to put me? Kick the door down because you know if I get up in here, it's going to be a mess. I don't blame that devil for trying to keep you out of that neighborhood because he know if you get in that neighborhood, you're going to be a light in that neighborhood. You're going to change the whole dynamic. You're going to change the whole demographic. There's a praying man on this block. There's a praying man on this corner. There's a praying man in this community. All my praying people, give God a shout right here. Number two, y'all with me? Number two. I want to talk to you about perseverance. Here's my issue with the saints when it comes to open doors. That a lot of times we get stuck in the doorway. We get stuck. We pray for God, open the door. And when you get in the door, you're so busy shouting in the doorway that you don't go all the way in. And a lot of people will shout all the way up to the door and not go through the door. See, when I came to church this morning, I came through the doors because everything that God wanted me to do was going to be on the other side of that door. I'm saying to somebody that everything that God has for you is on the other side of that door. And what happened with the saints is you're excited because God opened the door. You're excited because God opened the door for you to have the business, but you ain't working the business. You're excited that God opened the door for you to meet somebody to marry, but you ain't working the marriage. You're praying because God has called you into ministry, and I feel his anointing on me, and I feel the shake and the quivers, but you ain't doing ministry. So there you are shouting in front of the door. I suspect that many people in here right now, you are stuck in the doorway. That the door is swung right open for you. And you are stuck between here and there. And that you are posting and you are bragging and you are uh, uh, carrying on about the door that God has opened without actually walking in through the door that God has opened for you. I'm trying to tell somebody something. We are moving into a day where it no longer makes sense for us to shout at the door that we never go through. To shout about blessings that we never actually receive. 
to shout about a business. You slapped your name on it, but you ain't doing the work to make the business prosperous. Who cares if you got a name on the business if you ain't doing nothing with the business? So you brag about God called me. God called me. He's anointed me. And you feel the shaking, but you ain't doing no ministry. No service, no preparation, no nothing. You're just excited about the door. Open. Push on somebody. Say, God said, go through the door. I came this morning to push somebody through the door. You were stuck, as it were, between here and there. You were stuck right in the doorway. You're jumping up and down in the doorway. You're shouting in the doorway. You're clapping your hands in the doorway. But the Holy Spirit told me to push you on your back and push you through a door. Look above my God. Would you push on about three people and said, I came to push you through the door? You're standing there looking at it and gazing at it and peeking through it. But God said, I'm going to push you through a door. I'm telling somebody in here, God's about to push you into everything that you ever thought was possible. That he's going to push you into the area of your imagination. That you're not going to just talk about it, but you're going to be about it. Slap about three pros and say, go through the door. 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 Not enough for us to just brag about the door. You got to press your way in. If God opens the door for you, you have a responsibility to get up and go through it. That if he's God enough to open it, then you need to be man or woman enough to walk through it. That if God has thought enough of you to open the door for you, see, God's a gentleman. He's old school. Come on, you ladies. See, see the young guys are about their child. Let's get in the car. Get your hips on in there. But those old school gentlemen will walk all the way on the other side of the car and open the door for you and let you slide up in there. You ain't even got to touch the door. God said the doors are open for you right now. You ain't even got to touch it, baby. You ain't got to manipulate. You ain't got to cajole. You ain't got to take down. You ain't got to take down or compromise. I'm going to open the door for you and let you slide on in. But don't you sit outside this car. You better get your hips in here. <laughs> Thinking I'm sitting there with this door open for nothing. How crazy do you look if a man opened a door for you and you stand there looking at me? God said, why are you standing there looking at me? Get your hips. Slap about three people say, he's opened the door for me. He's opened the door for me. See, when God opened the door, can't nobody shut it. When God opened the door, they be mad. They don't want you to have, but they can't do nothing about it. He opened the door for me. He opened the door so wide that I didn't have to hurt nothing getting myself in. Oh, my God. When God opens a door for you, my issue with some of us is also when God opens a door, you, you, you take your time. You meander through the door. You be checking this stuff out and stuff while you walking through the door. Because you more worried about how you look. You want to be pretty going through a door. You got to check the mirror while you're going through a door. But I come to tell somebody that when God opens a door, baby, you got to run. You got to run. My problem with the saints is when God calls you to do something, we fixing to do it. We meander. We walk. We slow walk through it, Don. We going to get around to it. But real people of purpose who are mission minded, they were sitting there as it were on the starting block. And I was just waiting for this door to open. I was just waiting for this opportunity. Let me tell you something. When God gives me something, I was already waiting on it. He told me years ago he was going to do it. And I stood there as it were as a runner on the block. And when the gun went off, I took off running. I need some people in here who are ready to go after your dream with everything you got to jump on your feet and shout, I'm going for it. This is the year that God said you need to go for it. Stop talking about it. Stop thinking about it. Stop fixing to do it. Push on somebody and say, go for it. Go for it. It reminds me of those people who are sitting at a traffic sign and there's a green light over their head that's flashing. 
And instead of hitting the gas, they sitting there like they lost or confused or distracted. And don't it make you mad to sit behind somebody at a green light and they don't go? I want to holler out the window, green means go! <laughs> Fool! I see, as it were, over somebody's life, a flashing green light telling you it means go. It's been stopped for a while. It's been paused for a while. But there's a green light over your life. I don't know what your thing is, but God said whatever it is, he said go for it. Green doesn't mean stop. Green doesn't mean slow down. Green doesn't mean wait for your friends. Green means go. Stop waiting for other people to see your dream before you go for it. There is a green light over your life. Slap somebody and say, God said go. Last thing and I'm done. Don't be discouraged. I'm going to talk about pathways. Pathways. What I mean is this, don't be discouraged because the door is closed. Because you can only walk through a door that God opens to you. And when the door closes, this is what most of us do, when the door is closed, we stop. We give up. We walk away. But when the door is open, when the door is closed to you, and it doesn't want to open, just look for another door. When God has promised you something and you can't go through that door, find another door. Find another way in. Find another way to get to it. My Bible tells me that when David was come up against a city called Jabez, that all the doors were shut down. They were closed tight. Couldn't nobody get in or out. And David told his men that if you're going to conquer this one, you have to get down in the waterway. And everybody comes up through the waterway. The waterway was the sewer. The doors were locked, the windows were locked, everything was shut down. But everybody that's willing to get down and come through the sewer will get the victory. And so everybody that's willing to get down in the mud, in the dirt, in the muck, this may not be the way you thought I was coming in, but I'm getting in anyway. We got too many cute folks in the church. We got pretty folks in the church. You want the victory, but you want to have a cute victory. You want to got a pretty victory, but sometimes you got to get mad and get ugly and get crazy looking and say, I'm going to get down into this. God has promised me this city, and even though the door is closed, I know there's a way. I'm going to find me a sewer. I'm going to find me an entryway. I'm going to make me an entryway because God has promised me the city. Would you look at somebody and say, you got to get down for this one. For this next blessing, you got to go off. That's the way I can put it, Catherine. You got to go slap off. You gonna have to go bananas. You got to be willing to look crazy for a minute. If you're gonna get your money together, you gotta to do some radical changes to your spending. Yeah, I gotta go there with y'all. If you're gonna get your relationship together, you gotta to make some radical changes to your behavior. If you want God to give you a promotion, you might have to make some radical changes to your style, to the way you dress, to the way you speak. If you want God to push you to that next dimension, you can't be worried about what nobody think. You're too worried about what people think. Oh, I got to look a certain way and I got to be a certain way. For this next blessing, you got to act fool. You have to act crazy. You got to go off. So Y'all ain't going off in here. That's why people in this, in this church get a little bit confused, Don. Because when we tell them to praise God, they want to give them a cute praise. Connie, they want to give the kind of praise where you don't mess up your hair. <laughs> yeah, I ain't going to scuff these red bottom shoes or nothing. Yeah, I don't mess up my top or nothing like that. I don't mess up my tie. But for everybody that knows and don't care what you look like, and don't care if you mess up your hair. And don't care if you got guests and visitors who ain't trying to be changing who you are because you got folk that ain't seen you before. For everybody that just don't care what nobody think, and you know that praise is your weapon, I want you to pull out a radical praise because you need a radical breakthrough. I don't care about you looking at me. I don't care what you're saying about me. I don't care about you saying it don't take all that. It takes all of that and then some. I want the radical praises who are ready to get down in the mud and get crazy and get radical and go off.
enough to give him a praise right here. I said, give him a crazy praise right here. That ain't crazy enough for me. When David's men came up through the waterway, they were muddy, they were nasty, they were sweating, they looked crazy, but they got to victory. Where are my crazy people at in here? Where are my radical people at in here? Where are my people who don't care what nobody thinks? Would you touch somebody and tell them, neighbor, this is how you act when you really need a breakthrough. This is how you act when you're walking into your blessing. This is how you act when the devil can't stop you. Come on and show him. This is how you act. Get out of here with that cute stuff. Get out of here with that crazy stuff. Get out of here with that pretty stuff. I need some radical praises in here. Where my radical praises at? Impact Church, I come to tell you, if you're going to bring this city to its knees, you ain't going to do it being cute. You ain't going to do it being pretty. You ain't going to do it trying to be somebody that's important. You got to act a fool up in here. Let them laugh at you. Let them say you're crazy. Let them say you're a holy roller. Let them say you're unsophisticated. Let them say you're uneducated. You can say all that, but I'm giving me a breakthrough. Somebody shout hallelujah up in here. Hallelujah. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Put my music down. Listen. Listen. Whenever you're standing in front of an open door, it does not always mean no. It may mean not right now. It may mean not right here. It may mean not yet. You may be somebody who's stuck between doors. You are stuck in the hallway between a door that is closed and the door you're waiting to open. And while you're in between doors, you can't stand there and complain and fuss and cuss and go off and go to sleep and lose your cool. If you're stuck between doors right now, God said to tell me just praise him in the hallway. Never mind. Where are my radical people in here that are praise God in the hallway? I just had a door closed. I just had a relationship closed. I just had an opportunity shut down. But I'm believing God's going to open up something else, something better, something bigger. And it hasn't happened yet. But while I'm waiting, I'm going to give God a shout in the hallway. All my hallway shouting people, jump on your feet and give them a shout right here. You ain't shouting. You looking at me. You ain't shouting. You looking at your neighbor. You ain't shouting. You worried about what people think. I said shout up in here. There are two, two, two. Hold on. There are two Greek words that speak of time. There is chronos and there is kairos. Chronos talks about sequential, chronological. It's time in order. But there is a kairos, which is an opportune moment. God exists outside of chronos. God steps up in your kairos, which means he may not come when you want to, but he always shows up on time. Look at somebody say, he's going to show up on time. The answer may not be no the answer may be not right now. We always talk about the God who opens doors, but nobody wants to talk about the God who closes doors. Because the same God who will open a door is also the same God who will close a door. And I thank God that sometimes he'll close a door. When God talked to Noah and he got all of his family in the ark and got all the animals in the ark, the Bible said that God closed the door. That the door was so big and so wide that no man could close it, that God actually closed the door. And when God closed the door, it kept them from being killed. It kept the, oh, the enemies outside. It kept out the water. It kept out the flood. I'm coming to tell somebody that God is closing some doors for you. 
I see in the spirit, as it were, some things that were about to attack you, that were coming against you, that were going to drown you, that were going to kill you, that were going to destroy you, that were going to ruin you, that were going to mess up your reputation. But I see a divine door being closed. God is closing the door on everything and everybody that is trying to kill me. Would somebody thank God for a closed door? Then everything the devil tried to do, it's not going to work. God said, I closed the door. If you ain't got no other reason to praise him, you want to praise him for that. For every door that's shut, for everything the devil tried to do, for everything he wanted to happen, for everything he set up and God shut it. Clap about three people say he shut a door. He shut a door. He shut a door. Can I be honest? I'm standing in this place because God shut a door. He shut down the rumor. He shut down what they said. He shut down what they were trying to do. He shut down the setup that I didn't even know about. Somebody give God a shout because he's... I'm trying to get some mature people in here. I'm trying to get some people to stop moving away from this shout because the door is open. But stop maturing to the place that you thank God for the door that he closed. I'm so glad I didn't have who I thought I wanted. I'm so glad I didn't take the job I thought I wanted. I'm so glad I didn't go to the city I wanted to go to. I'm so glad I didn't go to the place I wanted to go to. Because if I had done that, I wouldn't be who I am right now. Somebody give God praise for God closing a door. I'm trying to mature you to a place that you understand that even closed doors are in God's will. That the truth of the matter is whether the door is open or whether it's closed, it's God's hand on the knob. And I submit to his will because whatever he does, whether he opens it or closes it, Everything he does is going to be for my good. Oh, oh my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That if God closed the door, it's because he knew it wasn't going to be good for me. He knew it was going to hurt me ultimately. He knew they were going to break my heart. So he closed the door. He had to close the door with his divine hand because you didn't have the nerve or the courage or the faith to close it yourself. And there are some relationships that God is closing down that you don't have the nerve to break. And God said, that's all right. I'm going to break it. You don't have the courage to walk away from it. And God said, that's all right. I'm going to break it. That you don't have the nerve to get away from it. But God said, it's all right. I'm going to close the door. Oh, my God. I'm going to shut the door on them. I'm going to make it where they can't get to you, where they're not even interested in talking to you, where they don't want to be around you. And you want to cry about it. But really, it's me closing the door. Is there anybody in here that can thank God for closing some doors for you? That if you had who you thought you wanted, your life would be miserable right now. Thank you, Lord, for closing the door. That if I had the job that I had my mind on, I wouldn't have as much freedom as I have. I wouldn't have as much joy as I have. I wouldn't have as much peace as I have. It was more money, but it was less peace. And God closed the door. Slap somebody and say he closed it. He closed it. He closed it. And at the opportune time, he opened the door. When you're stepping out onto a new thing, into a new season, into a new opportunity, something that you did not even expect. God said, I'm closing a door because I'm going to open up to something better later. If you believe what I'm saying, give God a shout right here. I'm going to close with this. Interesting thing that God said to John on Patmos. When he was writing to the seven churches, he said to the church of Philadelphia, he said, listen, though you are few in numbers, though you are a little flock, yet you have been faithful to keep my word. And you've been faithful to my name. Though you are small in strength, though you didn't have the ability to defend yourself, but everybody laughed at you and said, look at that little flock. Look at that little church. Impact church. How many is there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Da, da, da. What kind of name this pastor got? Is he popular? Is he famous? Come on, pastor. Is he a social media influencer? 
How many people are watching him? Let me check his numbers. What's his following like? How many people on his Instagram? God said, even though you were a little flock, one thing you did do, you kept my word. You gave priority to my word. You lifted up my word above everything else. That's why we preach the word over here. Because we understand that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word. You kept my word. And you kept my name. You weren't ashamed of my name. You didn't hide my name. You didn't try to blend in. You didn't try to mix cultures. You didn't try to be ashamed of who I was. And because you kept my name and you kept my word, as a consequence of just you being faithful, I'm opening to you a door that no man can shut. Oh, God, I wish you'd hurry up in here. Because you were faithful to me, I'm going to open a door. And this door will not open because of your influence, your numbers, your, 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 all the things that you want to brag on, your education, your contacts, your connections. The door I'm about to open, no man can shut. The door I'm about to open is going to be so big, it's going to blow people's minds. The door, I, I wanted you to be too weak to push the door open. Because when it does, Connie, you won't be able to brag and say you did it. You're going to have to say God did this. That this is a God thing. When I give you a promotion, I wanted them to think you wasn't qualified. Because when you get it, you're going to be able to say God did it. God this door. God bless these kids. God bless this marriage. Y'all not going to talk to me. God bless this business. I don't have the education or the background or the training or the exposure or the connection. But I'm still going to get there because God did it. When somebody shout, God did it. God did it. God did it. Because you've been faithful to me, I'm going to open a door. Listen, I, I, uh, this church has an alarm system, incidentally, that uh, even if I'm not in the church, if somebody opens a door here, an alert comes to my phone. I could be miles away. And the alert comes to my phone. Now, here's what's interesting. I don't always know who came in. I'm not even sure who came in. I don't know if it's Deacon Green or Deacon Brown or I don't know if Johnny walked in. I don't know if it's, amen, I don't know who came in the door. But what I do know is that an alert has gone off that made me aware that a door is open. Come on, Pastor. So if I'm curious... I'll get in my car or I'll get on my phone and I'll come down and say, who came in the room? But even before I got there, the alert has gone off. I'm not there yet, but the alert has gone off to let me know that a door is open. I hear, as it were, an alarm going off in the spirit. Everybody got an ear to hear what I'm saying. I hear, as it were, in the spirit, an alarm coming off. And you may not be there yet. You may not have your money together. You may not have your resume together. You may not have your contacts together. You may not have all your ducks in a row. But God said there's an alarm going off in the spirit that's letting you know that a door is open. A door is open. A door is open. And I hear as it were in the spirit God saying that a door is open. You just got to get in position. You just got to start making your way towards it. A door is open. A door is open in your finances. There's a financial breakthrough that's coming your way. A door is open. Oh my God, I wish I could hear. I can't get out of my spirit, Deacon James. I hear God saying a door is open. A door is open. A door, I don't know where it is. 
I got to find it. I got to make my way to it. I got to get my clothes on, jump in my car and get down there because a door is open. And I'm coming to tell somebody you're moving too slow. You're lagging along. You're acting like God hasn't heard you. Don't get mad because you ain't found it yet because there's a door. A door is open. Slap about three people and say, a door is open. A door is open. A door is open. It's not a crack. It's a wide door. It's so wide you can't touch the sides of it. This is a two-handed blessing. It's not something you see in the natural. See, you got to receive it in your spirit before you receive it in your natural. I haven't figured out who opened the door yet, but God already told me that the door is open. So I'm praising God because the door is open open somebody shout it the door is open come on somebody said the door is open say it again the door is open say it one more time come on say it by faith to my finances in my relationships in my ministry on my job shout and give God a praise if you believe it the devil's been saying it's over you're not going to get it you're not going to get there but God said the door is I'm talking to somebody who's had doors shut on you who's had opportunities shut down who've had people say no. You've been to, I don't know how many loan officers and everybody's saying no. God said the door is open. Relationships after relationships, bad contacts, bad connections. And you're thinking there's nobody that's gonna be able to help you and fund your dream and fund your business. God said the door. You've been feeling like you're on an island by yourself And nobody can help you get to the next level. And God sent me to tell you this morning, the door is open. Here's what Jesus said. Spirit said, the day that you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Harden not your heart. The day that you hear my voice. What that simply means is that you may not feel conviction all the time. The door is not open all the time. But the day I say to you that the door is open, that is your sign to make your way to the exit. That whatever you're into, trapped by, whatever's got you bound up, that when the Spirit gives you a sign that the door is open, that is a sign that you can get out of it. Get out of it. Every addiction you may have, every struggle you may have, Every habit you may have, when you sense the Spirit of God on you like that, that means run. That means go. That means dart for the door. And I hear in the Spirit God saying that a door is open. This is a door of opportunity. Everything you've been believing God for is on the other side of this door. Everything you've been waiting on. The devil's been lying to you, saying, it ain't out there. It ain't going to happen. The loan's not going to go through. You ain't never going to find love. This is a bad time to start a business. It's never going to work. Nobody's going to support you. You too old for that. You too old for that. You should have did that 30 years ago. You don't have the right connections for that. You don't know nobody. God said to tell you, the door is open. Stand to your feet all the building. Bow your heads and close your eyes. For somebody, this this is a moment. It's not just a sermon. It's a prophetic word. I felt a prophecy over it while I was speaking it. Sometimes you have sermons. It's a message. But sometimes it's a prophetic word. Like you were supposed to hear this today. For the things that you have on your heart. Some of you right now are getting ready to walk away 
from things you knew God gave you because it's not working out like you thought. God, they ain't paying attention to me. They ain't giving me no play. They're not calling my name. They don't even know I'm here. I'm on this job. I'm being passed over for promotions. I'm in this church. I'm working. I'm serving. And nobody seems to pay attention. I got gifts in me, Lord. I got talents in me. I'm better than this. And the enemy will sometimes talk you out of the place that God himself has put you in. And make you think that there's nothing else. But God, God put you in the right place at the right time. You know, a door don't always look like a door. It don't always look like a door. You're frustrated. This ain't no door. <laughs> if this was a door, it'd have a bigger check attached to it. <laughs> if this was a real door, it, it, it would somehow project me into a place that people recognize me. God said, it's a door. It's, it's a door. True, it's a door. It's a, it's a small door. Just a window. But through this window, I'm going to change everything about your life. Bow your heads, close your eyes. In this room right now is somebody who is struggling with the decision to follow Jesus or not. And they're looking at us saying, what, what is this Jesus thing? What is this Jesus thing? I, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. I, I, I want to be somewhere where it's fancy and it's big and it's bombastic. God, you put me in a little church with a little flock. They got big praise, but they're a little church. <laughs> they ain't got no big band. Where the band at? No big choir? Where the choir at? Lord, it's not even in an easy location. I got to make a few turns just to get to the church. <laughs> Where the famous people at? I walked in the building. I was trying to find the influential people, the famous people, the educated people, the smart people, the rich people. I, they ain't in here. And I'm trying to figure out how we supposed to pastor a city with a little flock. <laughs> but I heard God say, Daphne, I've opened a door for you, Jesus. I've opened a door for you to impact this city, to impact this church, to impact people's lives. You're in this church on purpose. I made it small enough to give you personal attention because I knew for what you needed, you didn't need all that. You needed some place you can go and get personal, specialized attention for the place you are in your life right now. It's going to get bigger, but right now, this is the place you need. So I drew you here to prepare you for the next thing in your life. If you're in this morning and you don't know Jesus, I want to challenge you in this moment 